everyone, I'm Abigail, this is Claire, and welcome to another Two Kids interview. Today, we are joined by award-winning author Andrea Wang. Ms. Wang has written the middle grade book, The Many Meanings of Mei Wan. She has also written the picture books, Louis, Magic Ramen, and Neon Monster. And the wonderful Newbery Honor book, Watercress. Also, coming in 2024 is Worthy, The Brave and Capable Life of Joseph Pierce. And a middle grade book that we are super excited about, Summer at Squee, that comes out in March. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Happy to be here. <laughs> you write both picture books and middle grade books. What do you enjoy about, most about each? That's a great question. Um, I like picture books because... They are a little bit faster to write just in terms of the first draft, um, you know, and maybe I don't need to do as much research. And uh, I love that there are illustrations in the picture books. And so what my words don't say, the art gets to fill in, right? And then for middle grade, I love that I can create a whole new world out of my imagination. And then I can just go on and on and talk about all the different colors and sounds and everything, you know, down to the clothes that people are wearing. Um, so it lets me really explore my imagination and, and think up details like that. And, and middle grade books are, and middle grade novels are most more likely to have a sequel so you can actually stay with the characters. Yes, you can. I don't have any plans for sequels at the moment, but I really enjoyed writing Melon's story. So fingers crossed, maybe someday there will be another story about her. There's more representation in books now than ever before. You and your books are a part of that trend. Is that something that is important to you? Very much so. Um, it's really important to me. I didn't have any books in my small town library that really represented Chinese Americans who were like me. And so I write, um, you know, all my main characters are Asian American or Chinese American because I want to write the books that I didn't have as a kid. I think it's really important that we all get to see ourselves in books. We notice that in many meanings of Meilan, that there are some similarities to your life. And, of course, watercress comes directly from your life. Can you tell us advan the advantages, and if there are any, disadvantages to writing from your own life perspective? Oh, that's a good question. So I would say the advantage of writing from my life experience is that um, I don't have to make up as much, right? I know how I felt, or I can take a setting that I know very well, like Boston's Chinatown. Um, and so that makes it a little bit easier. The hard part though, is making myself so vulnerable on the page, especially with watercress. I was basically showing everybody how um, alone and, and sad I was as a kid and, and angry too, that I didn't feel like I belonged. And so when that book was published, I felt very exposed, almost as though someone had taken my diary and, and shown it to the whole world, right? You can imagine how, how nerve wracking that must have been. Um, but, you know, so that might be the disadvantage, but I think the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Um, so I still really like to draw from my own life because most of the time I write because I'm working out, you know, my, my own issues that I had as a kid. <laughs> We've interviewed a number of authors who've had books banned, which means that many kids won't have the same access to books we do and possibly not see themselves represented in books. Can you give us your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think it's terrible um, that this is happening, that people are, you know, essentially two or three parents in a community can get books banned for all of the children in a community is just wrong. Um, and many times those book banners are reacting, I think, out of fear, right? And I think that people need to react to new people and new situations that are different from them with curiosity and kindness instead of saying, you know, we don't want them in our community. We don't want our kids reading about them. Um, I think that's exactly the wrong way to go about um, doing things. And 
you know, I, I have a number of friends whose books have been banned and it's it's really sad. I hope that we can all work together to, you know, not, not just write more diverse books, but also to uh, to work against the book bans. We agree. I feel like other parents, I don't think they should be allowed to to be able to take those books away from those kids. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's one thing to for a parent to say, I don't want my own child to read about this yeah. if they feel like their own child might not be ready for that kind of story. But it's um, it's limiting the other person's freedom to say your child can't read this. Right. Yeah. It's what is your process when putting a book together? Do you decide to end before the middle or do you put it together in order? Oh, um, how do I put a book together? So I used to write from beginning to end, you know, and chronologically. And then when I wrote Melan, I, you know, I could be taking a walk with my dog or I could be in the shower and I would have an idea for a scene. And I'd be like, oh, no, 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 that's not what I'm writing next. I need to write the next part um, in the timeline. But then I was afraid of losing those ideas for those other scenes. So I actually started to write Melan completely out of order. Just whatever would pop into my head, I would write that scene or that chapter. And then I have a special software program where I could uh, look at all those scenes and, so and, and chapters and then um, like a puzzle piece, put it into the different places where I thought they belonged. Um, and with picture books, I tend to write in order just because they're shorter. Um, but, you know, it's different for every book, right? I think sometimes I write a lot at the beginning of a picture book manuscript, like like thousands of words more than I know will be in the actual book. Um, but then it's my way of figuring out what the heart of the story is. So I just keep kind of writing and writing until I figure out my themes. And then I cut away everything that doesn't um, uh, pertain to the theme. You have an upcoming book worthy. The Brave and Compatible Life of Joseph Pierce is an Asian, Amer Asian American history book. I don't feel like there's a lot of that. Is that why you wrote it? And do you think you'll write more books highlighting Asian American history? Absolutely. Um, I really like writing books about history that has been hidden, that hasn't been taught in schools in the United States because I was never taught um, about these people or about these events. And in Worthy, I um, actually heard about the Chinese Americans who fought in the American Civil War through my editor, who asked me if I wanted to write a story about this. And so I narrowed it down to the, the life of Joseph Pierce, because I thought it was really interesting. And, you know, I think it's important for us to have, um, as Asian Americans, to have role models in all sorts of different fields, whether it's science or, you know, the military in this case. Um, we need to see that Asian Americans can do all sorts of things. You also have another book coming out in March, <laughs> Summer at Squee. Can you tell us a bit about that book? Sure, I'd be happy to. It's another standalone middle grade novel, which means it's not a sequel. Um, it doesn't overlap with Milan at all. Um, but it is about a Chinese American girl who lives in Massachusetts, and she has been going to a Chinese heritage camp uh, since she was six years old. And her mom actually helps run the camp, right? And it's like her favorite place to be in the world. It's her safe space. She's got all her really good friends there. She doesn't feel like she needs to explain anything about being Chinese American while she's there because everybody else is Chinese American. But this is her last summer at this camp, which um, they've all called Squee because the camp's real name is really, really long. So they took all the initials um, and and uh, made it. And, and it sounds like Squee. So that's what they call it. And she has discovered once she gets there that a whole bunch of new girls have come to camp and they are adopted Chinese girls. And so they've grown up not really knowing Chinese American culture. And so my main character kind of struggles with what does it mean to be Chinese enough, you know, and she has to think differently about uh, her own identity. Camp books often do have sequels, just saying. 
<laughs> there are plenty of characters in Summer at Squee. There are 12 campers in this group. So yeah, maybe I could write companion novels and sequels. <laughs> yeah. We know you take many things from your own life and put them in your books. Do you ever just notice something on the street or anywhere else? See something and think, I need to put that in a book? Absolutely. All the time. Um, yeah, I have lots of notebooks filled with random observations uh, that I've seen on the street or conversations. I like listening to people's conversations, Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> but sometimes I'll go back and write down what the kids have been saying. Um, just, you know, I write down a lot of those little things. Even while I'm reading newspaper articles, I might get ideas for stories and books. And so um, a lot of what's in Milan, you know, did come from my own life, but also my friends' lives and, you know, different things that my Asian American friends have experienced um, or I've, you know, seen on the street. So, yeah. You write in beautiful verse. Is that harder? And do you think kids should try it or wait until they're older? Oh, you don't have to wait to write poetry. You can write poetry no matter what age you are. Um, it just is how you want to express yourself. And sometimes it might be easier to express yourself in poetry um, you don't need to write whole, you know, formal sentences with, a, you know, a subject and a verb and an object and all of that and, and all the grammar that you learn in school. So you can break some rules with poetry, which I like. Um, and I think, you know, in, in Milan, I wrote not in verse, but sort of more lyrically, because that's how I think Milan thinks, because she's been reading so many fairy tales. So I sort of wanted to capture that language of old style, you know, fairy tales. And then watercress, I kind of consider to be free verse, like it's poetry, but it doesn't rhyme and it doesn't have any sort of set um, rhythm to it. But it let me break up the lines so I could emphasize words that I wanted um, the readers to really sort of linger on. So you can be, you can write in whichever way you want. I think the important thing is just to write and you can always switch back and forth. Once I made this swimmer at school and I had no clue at all what to write. And it's the silliest rim limerick you've ever heard. You would have ever heard. Do you remember it? Can you tell it to me? Okay. There once was a man named Sam. He met a girl named Pam. They went to France and pooped in their pants. <laughs> and now they're on the lamb. <laughs> I love it. That's perfect. I think that's everything a limerick should be, right? A little naughty. <laughs> I was really surprised I was allowed to do that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Writing isn't easy, and rejection seems to be a part of most writers' stories. Can you tell us about that part of your journey? About rejection? Yeah, that's hard. Um you do have to really have a thick skin to be a writer and to realize that, you know, I guess we say, you know, to our, to my other author friends, we, we tell each other, you know, every rejection is just um, one less that you get on your way to, to getting an acceptance, right? Um, some people get hundreds of rejections and then their book gets published by that one person who, it resonates with, and then they discover that so many people love that book. So um, I try not to let it get to me. I think I do, of course, feel sad when I get rejected, but I know that somewhere out there is a reader who will hopefully like my story, and I just need to find the right editor to publish my story. Um, it's really about the work itself. Um, I'm trying not to take it personally. It's not about my writing. Um, or who I am as a person, it's really about uh, the the story, um, the book. And so if a rejection comes with, you know, feedback that says you need to make this part stronger, or we didn't really connect to your character, then I know I need to go back and revise. And, you know, that's helpful. So some rejections can actually be really helpful um, once I get past the moping part of it. <laughs> so you're... Um... Do your editors tell you what parts you need to like work on? Yeah, absolutely. For Melan, it was it was a process for sure. Um, they, you know, my editor would send me maybe a ten page letter that said, 
these are all the things that I think you should think about. I mean, she was very, very nice and brought up a lot of good points, but you know, um, there was a lot to dig into and a lot to think about. Um, and we did that several times before the book, you know, was, was actually finished. <laughs> what writer has had the most influence on you? Oh, wow. This is hard because it's like asking me which is my favorite book. Um, and I can never answer that because I have so many favorite books. I do have a lot of authors that have influenced me. Um, you know, I think Amy Tan, who wrote The Joy Luck Club, really influenced me. She, I know The Joy Luck Club is not a children's book, but it was the first book that I read that showed um, Chinese Americans who um, were like me, you know, who had parents who were immigrants and and grew up here in the States. And so that really influenced how I thought about my own life and what I wanted to write about. What advice do you have for young people who want to write? I I know you've probably had a lot of guests that say this too, but it is to read, read everything, um, especially what you hope to write someday or are writing right now. Read, you know, as many books as you can in that genre, because I don't know all the rules of grammar and I don't remember doing very well in spelling, but the more I read, the more I increased my vocabulary and could spell better and somehow absorbed the way sentences are written and in different ways. So even though I might not know the names for all the the figures of speech, I you know they they turn up in my writing because I read a lot. And so reading helps you in so many different ways, not just you know uh, for writing, but also to expose you to the world. Yeah, I make comics, and reading other comics are really a really big part of that. Also, also just watching movies and reading comics, that's a really big part of it because I make action comics oh, and cool. detective comics, and those are really big parts of it. I read a lot of books, too, and it just, it teaches you a lot of things to make, and then, yeah. Yeah, you learn how other people think about things, too, right? Even if they're fictional people, they still have a different point of view. And so I, I find it really opens your mind. And yeah, and move. I love movies. I love TV. And those are just stories, too, right? And so when I watch TV or movies, I'm always thinking about, is this the part where the main character gets into the most trouble? <laughs> you know, Or, you know, I'm sort of analyzing it as a story as I watch it. So that's helpful, too. So reading was a big advice. Do you have also have some smaller tips, something you do when you're writing that maybe a lot of people don't? Tips, little tips that I do when I'm writing. Um, I do most of my writing on the computer, but I do take handwritten notes. And, you know, I don't know how, it's. I don't think it's that uncommon among people my age, but I know that you know, for instance, my two children who are in college only take notes on the computer. But for me, I find that I don't remember things as well unless I write them down by hand um, in a notebook. And it, for me, it's also easier to find those notes because I'll have sort of a mental image of where, which notebook it was in and maybe where, you know, in that notebook it was. Um, I also, when I'm uh, revising, I like to use all different colored pens and so if there's something to do with character development that I need to work on, I'll use one color and circle it. You know, I print it all out and I'll, I'll circle it or write notes in the margins. And if it's something about pacing, maybe I'll use a different color. So that helps me too. I'll go through and just address all the, the ones of the, all the comments of the same color and then go back again and address all the comments in a different color. Yeah, I don't... Like, I don't have a phone, and I don't have a watch, so, except, like, not an Apple watch, so I, I really don't have anything to take out of my pocket, any device, and go, oh, I'm going to go to notes, and I'm going to write this down. I just have to take out a mini notebook out of my pocket instead, and then write it down, because I can't take out anything else. But that's great, because 
your phone, I mean, I could drop it in the toilet one day and I'd lose all those notes, right? <laughs> but I'll always have a notebook. <laughs> I could dry it out and still be able to read it if I had to. We talked about your two upcoming books, Worthy and Summer at, S at Squee. But what are you working on now? Oh, I am, let's see, trying to figure out what I want to write for my next picture book. Um, I'm thinking about writing about Chinatown uh, and uh, the Chinatowns of the United States specifically. So like more history. Um, I also am working on a picture book that I guess you could consider to be a companion to Watercress. Um, but Watercress took me a long time to figure out how to write. So I don't know when that one's going to be done. Um, and you know, I'm I'm just sort of, I'm taking a little bit of time and doing some free writing. So when I don't know really what I want to work on next, I just uh, take notes and write a bunch of stuff and think about things and, and uh, you know, write down my observations and feelings and stuff until, yeah, I come up with a good idea. <laughs> that sounds great. But we like if you write more middle grade books. Okay. I will. I think I think I have a good idea. I actually have, I forgot to mention. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to mention it. Um, hasn't been announced yet, but I have a short story coming out in something someday. <laughs> but I really like the character that I wrote the short story about. So I'm hoping to expand her story into a middle grade. Finally, it's time for our turbo 10. 10 rapid fire questions. Are you ready? No, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Okay, number one, what is your favorite phrase to use? Um, what's my favorite phrase to use in writing? Anything. Uh, I, I go back through my manuscripts and I'm always writing the phrase, you know, over and over again and I have to take it out. So I guess, you know, I like saying, you know, a lot. <laughs> Number two, what is one subject you love to learn more about? Oceanography. I'm really, I think the ocean is really cool and full of really interesting creatures. And I'd like to learn more about that because um, I feel like it's one of those last unexplored places on the earth. Number three, what is your go-to snack food? <laughs> uh, chocolate and potato chips together. <laughs> <laughs> Number four, what is what was your favorite book growing up? My favorite book growing up, um, I loved the fairy tale books that were put together by a guy named Andrew Lang, and they're like called the Green Fairy Tale Book, the Yellow Fairy Tale Book, and they were stories that he collected uh, from all over the world. So those were really fun. Number five, if you could teleport somewhere right now, where would you go? Egypt. I've always wanted to see the pyramids. Yeah. Um, number six. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Invisibility. I want to eavesdrop on everybody's conversations without them knowing. <laughs> <laughs> number seven. What was your favorite cartoon as a kid? My favorite cartoon? I don't know. My brother usually had control of the TV. Um. Um. I actually really liked Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. Yeah. Number eight. What is your favorite rainy day activity? I think you can guess. Can you guess? Writing. Writing and reading. Reading, yeah. <laughs> Number nine. If you could have any three dinner guests, who would they be? Three dinner guests? Who would they be? Uh, Judy Bloom. Um, no rules at all. No rules at all. Um, Jane Austen and Amy Tan. Number 10. What is the best piece of advice you were ever given? Wow, the best piece of advice I was ever given by anyone about anything? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just about. I don't know. Um, I don't know if it, anything specific that I can think of, but just to believe in myself. 
You were awesome, and thank you so much for doing that. And thank you so much for spending, spending your time with us. We can't wait to read your future books. Well, thank you both so much for having me and asking such great questions and for reading my books. I Thanks really appreciate it. <laughs>